Primordial Radio. Welcome back to Primordial Radio. My name is Pete Bailey. Delighted today to be joined by Lejean Witherspoon of Seven Dust. Dude, how you doing? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Sorry for the delay, but I'm here. It's early in the morning. I love it. Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> what, uh, what, what, what time are you on right now? Uh, it's about 10.08 in the morning, but I've been up since six, so it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> ah, so you're an early morning riser. I never used to be, but as I'm progressing through my 30s, my body clock seems to be going earlier and earlier and earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, and also, we, yeah, I have kids here, so my son had to go to summer camp at around 9 o'clock, and uh, he gets out at noon. But I remember when summer camp, when you went at 9 o'clock, you stayed until 5. So I don't understand the summer camp from 9 until 12. It's like, wait a minute, you don't even feed them. So <laughs> daddy's got to pick them up, then take them to lunch. What happened to the summer camp? <laughs> <laughs> I'd imagine it's quite chaotic parenting uh, whilst being in in a band, you know, just the the very nature of that. I think of how difficult parenting is just in general, but it must be tricky when maybe, you know, you go away for three or four months and you come back and then trying to manage all these things. Like, how, how do you manage being a metal musician and parenting? That's a very good question, because, you know, you always feel like when you leave for a tour and you leave for two months and you come back and everything is still going the longest plan because mommy's taking care of everything. But I feel like things are out of order. They're like, no, it's the way it should be. You've been gone for a long time. So, mm. <laughs> so let me tell you what, this that's a very good question because the pandemic was so very bad and unfortunate for everyone around the world. But the upside for the pandemic for me and my family, and I feel like maybe for other people, I would hope for an artist, the normalcy of being away was not right. Like I was gone. Mm. You know what I mean? Like what I thought was normal. Like, hey, daddy's here. How you doing? Uh, it's not normal. Yeah, you know, I was able to be here for like the first day of school. I was able to be there for the daddy daughter dance. So I didn't have to have my family doctor take my daughter. I was able to be at practices. I was able to, you know, to do things that and not saying to take anything from anything, but it brought me closer to my family. And I think it helped me as a writer and as an artist for this next album and for the future to have that situation happen to all of a sudden be like, oh, this is what's normal. This is, you know, like seeing these kids and not missing out, even though we love what we do out there. And it's so important to, to give the medicine to the people with the music, but oh my God, what have I been missing here? Thank the Lord that I was able to rebuild that structure with the family, if that makes sense, not to get too far away. Absolutely. So has that sort of made you rethink how you are doing Seven Dust moving forward? So rather than like, right, well, we're going to go for four months and then it's two weeks off and then another three months. So you sort of rethinking how you do the band now post pandemic? Oh my God, that was me. We did that before. So we've already slowed that down where, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, at this point in time, it's definitely, uh, you know, we we pick and choose and we make the right decisions. I feel like it's like chess and you have to make the right moves. But definitely it's important to be uh, uh, exist. I, what's, what's the word? Ap not not absent, but it's important to be present mm -hmm. in everything that you can be present in. You know, the, the, the fans, the family, the touring, but also it's important to be dad and the husband and you know, I get yelled at, you know what I'm saying, with the wife. Yeah. You know, I get yelled at on the road, too. It's no different. We just have this platform to be able to, to present these this music, but we still deal with everything that everyone else deals with. So uh, I'm very glad to be able to talk to you and, and talk about this new album and, and uh, the future for the band. Absolutely. And just very quickly, before we get on to the, the new album, I wonder, will you take your kids out on tour, like you know, when they're at the appropriate age, or you'd be thinking, no, hell no, they ain't going out on the road. Oh, no, they, they've all, <laughs> no, no, they've already been out on tour. They, yeah, my kids go out on the road. Let, let, check this out. The last tour that Seven Us did, we went out for two and a half weeks at Alter Bridge, and I got back home, and I normally don't, I wouldn't want to go to see a show or anything, but uh, my whole family, from my son, that's six, to my daughter, that's 15, to the wife, said, hey, uh, we want to go. Will you take us to go see the band Bad Omens? Mm, great band. I'm like, yeah, I love that band. They're like, we love them too. And I was like, okay, whatever. So we made a couple of calls and got in there and uh, took the took the family. 
and I was watching, I took video, I actually see it on my Instagram, and my family knew more of the Bad Omen songs than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and the same with Sleep Token. My daughter knows more about, you know, new, but that's really cool to me that they're, uh, they're interested and they love all music and not only metal, but, it, it, you know, my, my, my house, we play everything. I feel like music is a, is a healer and, uh, and you find conviction in every type of music. Absolutely. I think kids could be a great way to keep you up to date with music and uh, not, not, not keeping your rot sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Even though I'm so, uh, my daughter didn't want to go to the Taylor Swift concert and I was like, oh, really? Why not? She's like, it just costs too much money and I don't think it's worth that much. And I was like, yeah, fair. I was like, you know what? Was, <laughs> More of that. <laughs> I was like, you know what? If between me and you, I was like, you know what? You're right. She does have enough money not to charge that much money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you're doing a four and a half hour concert. You don't need to be charging these cute babies a million dollars to come see you. <laughs> oh God, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's 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 pretty wild. And they got Paramore in support as well. Yeah, that whole thing is uh, is just crazy. It really, really is. Oh man. So uh, as we're recording this, a new album Truth Killer is uh, is going to be out in a couple of weeks' time. Sort of getting ready for the release via Napalm Records. Fourteenth studio album. Fourteenth studio album, dude. That is impressive. There are a lot of bands who have been going longer than you that aren't even close to 14 studio albums. So how do you stay creative? How do you keep the mo motivation levels up to get to album number 14? Life, the pandemic shutting us down and having to get back out, putting this album out right here, Blood and Stone, um, let's see, and then not being able to tour it. Thank the Lord that we got on the billboard, whatever, what, you know, still, but we weren't able to tour it. So we were ready to get back out. And I feel like we put that energy into this new album to come back out there into the world with it being uh, hopefully safe enough for us all to be in this situation. And it seems like it's going to be good, man. I can't wait. And obviously uh, I didn't realize that we were able to still sign record deals. Thank the Lord for Napalm for signing seven to us. And all of a sudden, again, I'm talking to cats like you, uh, international press and knowing that that lets me know that we're going to get back over there. And that's what needs to happen. And uh, I can't wait to build the relationship again and not to anything to let everyone know that it wasn't anything due to seven dust. We just didn't have the means to get back because a lot of times you have to have that backing and a, a label or someone behind you to get all the way over there because it costs a lot of money for us to get there. So Napalm, I want to say thank you and thank you guys for doing this interview and, and letting us know that things are happening back over there again. I think it's interesting that you say that because if I think if you just said that to me, pre-pandemic about needing the cash to get over that sort of thing fans would have been like ah oh, you're in a big successful metal band like ah oh, why are you trying to pull the wool over my eyes now i think fans are very understanding they get it they've seen the cancellations they've seen the figures and they are eye-watering at times it's so it's so crazy and it's so disappointing as an artist and you're like okay we can do this and we're there and say, say like i'm sitting at home and i might be getting ready to come see you guys in a week and then like three days before we get ready to come it's like the budget's not right. It doesn't make sense. Blah, 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 this and that. And it's not on our end because all we want to do is come and perform. But as businessmen and businesswomen or whatever in this industry, you have to make the right decisions. And sometimes it's not in our hands. It's like, uh, ah, what do we do? You know? We're, yep. Yeah. You know, well, we're, this we're, is it because, I mean, there's been so many stories of bands losing tens and, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that's not, and that's a situation that you're not sort of too, um, unfamiliar with because you had financial issues uh, in, in in the noughties, right? Oh yeah, we almost went we went bank we almost went bankrupt to shut the band down. But I think those times made us work harder, and that's why we're here now. Uh, I think that put the the leather on our skin. You know what I mean? That's the armor. I mm. feel like this made us stick around for here and for now. And uh, those tribulations and trials, I feel like we wouldn't be the band that we are here today. You know, still, and it's still not like. Uh, what's that song that Nickelback? I love Nickelback. I want to be a rock star. It's still not like we don't have thousands of cars in the garages and boats everywhere, but you know. <laughs> but you're living comfortably, you're having a good life. And I think for most metal bands, that's that's the aim, right? Yeah, life has been good. No, I have a, I have a career. This is my job. This is what I do. I write music and I and tour the world. And I've been, you know, we've not been able to do that. And now it's opening back up again. It's time to get back to work. My wife's like, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> 
So on Truth Killer, then it does very much sound like it was a, a bit of a, a of a COVID record. So the the writing process being very different. What's it like, sort of writing being cooped up versus writing where maybe you did some songs on the road and you know and in different scenarios? Well, that's a good question. So this time, uh, I was able to bring the band for the first time. So my wife's grandparents left us a farmhouse. Their farmhouse. Uh, me and the wife went in by ourselves and remodeled this place, which was already beautiful. Everything was wood and everything. So I just want to change it. It's been like this for 30 years. I'm like, okay, whatever. So we put mm. all this beautiful wood, marble, and it's still on 300 acres in this farmland. The only neighbors that she has are her uncle and her aunt that maintain other properties with their cattle. We maintain about 15 acres with some cattle. I went out there and then when I was out there, I was like, you know what? This is the perfect place to write. Look at this setting. It's quiet. There's no one around except when a truck goes by, it's your cousin or your aunt or somebody. Mm. It's all you hear are the cows mooing. Uh, and so I brought Clint down and Clint was like, oh my God, this is amazing. We did a couple of songs. And then we were able to bring the whole band down. And let me tell you what happened. I remember the days of being a young band and having to find a place to jam. It was like that at grandma and grandpa's place. So once we were there, we set up in grandma's room, which is not her old bed. It's a new bed. <laughs> but mm -hmm. to, to imagine, imagine this Morgan's drum set in front of grandma's bed, Vinny on the bass sitting on the end of this big old bed, John with the guitar on the other side, the microphone there, Clint sitting behind the computer, and we're jamming and writing seven dust songs in this room, grandma's bedroom. And then I remember the next, uh, we were there for a week or so. The next couple of days, we moved into another room. And I remember the sun going down and John and I went out into the front of the house and there's a flag. And it's just really picturesque, you know, looking at all the, the land and nothing running across the streets or anything. And I looked in the front window and Vinny is sitting there. And all you can see is Vinny and John and their bass and guitar. And they were, they were recording seven dust songs for the Truth Killer album. And I was just sitting there like, if anyone knew what was going on in this farm house right now, <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And to wake up the next morning and John Conley uh, be looking out the window towards my the gated property where the cows are at and him, him drinking coffee before his jog. And he's like, man, I think one of the, the baby, he was like, one of the baby cows are out of the gate. And I was like, no way, it's a new gate out there. He's like, okay. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no, man, I think there's a baby calf out the, the gate. And I look out, I'm like, oh, my God, me and John Conley are outside. And the funny thing about it, this is a true story. He's got his biker running shorts on, a tank top, and he's doing this right here. And I'm like, stop doing that. You're making it. <laughs> I say, just be still. We're going to get him in. I first off, that outfit that you got on right there is freaking him out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But then, you know what made it so cool? But after that, we would go back in the farmhouse and then write another seven dust song. So for me, it just made it feel like those young men that started the band and it was not a care in the world. We grilled out, we laughed and uh, we told stories. We scared each other at the farmhouse. And it was just like a, it was us being young again. And then that, and we just took that energy back into Elvis's place. And that, that's a magic place too. So it was, it was just, for whatever reason, man, this album just seems like it aligned right for the timing. Primordial Radio. I think that's really come through on the album because I think a lot of the fans have made mention of the fact that it has a feel of previous Seven Duffs records. I've, I've heard a few people mention the fact it's almost like a celebration album of the band itself. Oh, oh wow, well, I've never heard that. That's great because I feel like we were afraid to do some songs that were originally seven dust because of, but you know what and it turned out like a song like fence is so seven dust that they love it and it's so it's it's so cool to to still be able to to grow and evolve and to stay on this avenue to go down different streets musically but people still understand that we have to evolve as people and as musicians and we don't all have to be like mm -hmm. you know you know what i mean everything oh if it don't sound like dsi i don't <laughs> like it no more but then guess what then move on we, we've grown past that. You know what I mean? We love melody. We love song. I want to be able to sing a song for the rest of my life as long as I'm able to live. And I don't, I don't think 
at 60, I'll be like, oh, you know what I mean? I want to be able to, <laughs> it might look oh, weird. Oh, man, I totally get that. <laughs> I totally get that. So we, 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 we talked earlier about you taking your kids to see the likes of Bad Omens and Sleep Token. And there's a, a lot of new bands now that are incorporating some aspects of new metal into their music today. I wouldn't say like, you know, it's sort of like it's 1998 all over again. But what are your thoughts on, on that time and, and that era? Because there are some bands that are happy to look back on it and others that are like, we, we, would, we would have a part of new metal. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I know. I know. So that's, that's, the, that's a great question, too. This interview is great. New metal. Who made that word up? What guy? Is it in the dictionary? I don't know. But obviously, there's a core, a group of people that believe in that. I would rather be new metal than old metal, I guess. But uh, in that new metal genre, I look at Seven Dust and I'm like, oh, man, yeah, it was cool. It's cool. We did play with a lot of those bands in that genre, like Limp Biscuits and whatever you say, whatever. But I feel like that we were different, but maybe in that era. So I don't have a problem with people categorizing us in that new metal era, but I don't under, I'm really, I don't know. I feel like we're older than new metal, but if it's cooler than old metal, then I just want to, I just want to be relevant. So, so I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you say you're older than new metal. Of course, the band started in 94. And so you, you, you predated the genre. Like, did you feel like you were kind of getting swept up as it was sort of all happening? Cause it all just kicked off so fast in the late nineties. Yes, it did. Think about this, man. All of a sudden, we were we left in a, a van from the Midtown Music Fest in Atlanta, Georgia, and never turned around. I don't think we came back home for a whole year when we first started. And like you just said, that makes sense. We got swept up. All of a sudden, we were at the fucking Oz Fest. What's going on? And you know, yeah, it was we were swept up in this movement, which makes sense to something that you said before with all these bands resurging. I feel like there's a movement going on, and people really don't realize it because they've been so clouded about what happened with the pandemic that we're all coming back out and it's a contagious energy, not like the sickness, but the energy of music and being around each other and being at a festival. I mean, it's back, man. It's a movement. Oh, man, honestly, the popularity seems to be off the scale at the moment. So I, I recently just went to Download Festival, which was over 100,000 people. Bring Me Headline the Friday. That was amazing. We talked about Sleep Token earlier. They sold out Wembley Arena here in the UK in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. No way. 10,000 tickets in 10 minutes. <laughs> what are you talking about? What, That's what are we talking about? That is there's like, a fucking movement going on. Yeah, there's a movement going, yeah, there's a movement going mm -hmm. on that, that's not being talked about much. You know what I mean? Because I don't realize, I don't think that we all, like we realize it, but I don't think everyone's so caught into the moment of being back and just like, Oh my God, we're back and we can do this. That they don't realize that they're making a, uh, this is very significant. And we'll look back at this and be like, look at what happened and look at what's going on right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So earlier we talked about some of the troubles that you faced as a band and some of those troubles that still persist this day, whether it's touring, financial issues and stuff like that. And I, I speak to a lot of new bands a lot of the time and they sometimes they come to me advice about what to do this and what to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking a few bands at the moment. What is the uh, the biggest mistake that you ever made as a band? And how did you learn and overcome from that mistake? Oh, wow. What a great question, too. Okay. The biggest, the biggest mistake I feel that bands make that doesn't make them survive or last is when you go into a situation where all of a sudden everything is not equal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Different royalty rates on contracts and that sort oh of thing. Oh, my God. So when you have this one guy showing up at the studio in a Lamborghini and this other guy's got a, not saying anything's wrong with a Toyota, but you got this one guy in a Toyota and another guy on a bicycle and maybe this other guy walking. But without everyone, it's not the, the, the group. I call those groups when it's not equal. A band is when it's equal and everyone knows that when they come in their part it counts you know it might not be the best but your part counts you know what i mean and it's not anyone leaving out like yeah man i'm making more money you know that that does not work i feel like that's kept us together i don't care what you do even in the beginning of our career when we didn't care about the money and all that stuff because the only thing we cared about was being out on the road, we didn't care about somebody stealing all our money. And at the end of a freaking tour, all we had was a Chico stick and like two t-shirts from the opening band. We're like, 
That's weird. But our manager just left in a limo and a damn Hummer and a submarine tied to the back of it, getting ready to go on vacation. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So as for me, the advice that I can give to anyone to take with that question, too, is we had to learn how to be businessmen, businesswomen, business whatever your genre are in this industry, too. You have to. You have to do your craft, but also know what's going on, because there's a lot of people out there that will take advantage of you. And, uh, and I'll do it, you know, at your cost. That is very, very good advice there. Uh, dude, this has been such an amazing chat. Thank you so much for this. And uh, we have big... No, thank you. Well, I was going to ask you, what are, those po- what are those frames back there? I can't, it's kind of blurry, but what are those? It looks cool. Uh, yeah, so, well, the, the two that are back there, so the first one that you can see, I'll just move my head there. So the first one is from a festival here in the UK called Focus Wales. Um, it, which it takes place in a in, in a town called Wrexham, which is where I went to university. Now Wrexham's getting a lot of highlights at the moment because that is the football club um, that uh, Ryan Re- uh, Ryan Reynolds, yeah, Ryan Reynolds. No way! Oh, I know what you're talking about. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I went to uni in that town, and the uni was literally it's basically connected to the football ground. I actually used to live across the road from the football ground, um, but. There's an amazing festival that happens across the whole of Wrexham Town uh, called Focus Wales. And it sort of takes over all of the various uh, venues in the town, cafes, actual venues, like any spaces they can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And so I went to that festival for like a good few years. I was uh, a speaker uh, at them uh, a few times, conferences, that sort of thing. Uh, And so that was from the year 2016. And then the one before that is Download Pilot. Uh, which is a very, very special poster because that was the first festival that came back after the pandemic. Oh, no way. It was 10,000 people. It was a mini download. Yes, exactly. Oh, my God. No way. I didn't know that. Uh, and you, you, had to do your, you had to do your COVID tests to to get in and you weren't allowed to leave site. And, and it really was. You know that moment that you talked about earlier about mm-hmm. connecting, you know, being young again? Um, it, it was like that at Download Pilot because everyone got in sight and it was really weird for like the first 30 minutes because everyone was right. No way. This is a great story. No one had touched it. We were all everyone had been con- conditioned to distancing. And then we got into Download Pilot and everyone was like, so what do we do? And then like first beers cracked, f- first beers cracked an hour later. It's like the pandemic never happened. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Oh, man, I would love to try to get one of those posters or uh, or a copy of that just for the story that you just told me. What an amazing experience to be involved in that experience at that time and being afraid and then still not knowing, but knowing that you were safe, but still being unsure. Well, what still a, a bit of a thing. risk. And yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It was one of those because like <laughs> you, just, yeah. you just sneeze. Yeah. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. You're good. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the phrase was across the weekend was like, "Are we hugging?" Like that, you know that 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 was the thing, and everyone, you're pretty much everyone was like, "Yeah, give us a hug," and it was all good. And uh yeah, oh yeah, exactly. wait a minute, that guy might be sweating a little too much. Don't hug him, but hug the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it was pretty wild. That will always be one of my great memories of coming out of the pandemic. Was uh, was download pilot. It it was so good. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> As we wrap up this conversation today, I just want to say we have been getting a wonderful response to the track Everything here on Primordial Radio. Um, so just tell me specifically about this song, how it came together, and uh, and I guess why you wanted to put this track really front and center as you were gearing to put the new album out. Man, think about everything, anything. I feel like this song is for the world, not just for certain people. It's for everybody out there that has felt uh, locked down, uh, you know, just not feeling like themselves. Uh, I feel like this is the summer song, the world song of just the triumph. I'm the ambassador, you know, for feeling good and making music come back and us to be healthy again. And uh, we can be everything. You know, I, I feel like that uh, it's a positive song just to uh, to focus on not letting anyone keep you down, man. Well, uh, dude, thank you so much for your time today. This is the first time we've spoken in my 10 plus years of doing radio, and it certainly won't be the last. Uh, Lejean, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for a beautiful morning, man. You made my day. I look forward to talking to you again. I'll see you soon. Primordial Radio.